Welcome to my channel, where the scariest stories come to life. Before we dive into today's chilling tale, make sure to hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications, so you never miss a story. Now, let's get into the horror. This story isn't mine, but my good friend's. I've never seen her this shaken while telling a story before. She's the most genuine and open person I know, so I believed every word she said. To keep her identity private, I'll call her Jen. Jen and I reconnect often, and when we do, we talk about pretty much everything. But one thing we especially love discussing is spirits and the supernatural. Being Native American myself, stories about skinwalkers or similar mystical beings aren't new to me, I even have my own stories. Jen, however, has this unique habit of going to open fields on nights with a full moon. We've done it together a few times, and it's always felt like a surreal experience. But one night, she went with a different friend, whom I'll call Jessica. Jen and Jessica went to an open field and began walking through it. But unlike other nights, something felt off to Jen. She thought she was hearing twigs snapping behind her. Since Jen has bipolar disorder, she initially brushed it off, thinking it might just be in her head. But as they continued, she couldn't shake an overwhelming feeling of unease, like she was being watched from all directions. They walked on until they reached the center of the field, where Jen started looking around. If you've ever been in the woods under a full moon, you know how it can light up anything not covered by trees. In that eerie glow, Jen saw something, and without saying a word, she bolted, leaving Jessica behind. Jessica reacted quickly and followed her to the car, where Jen immediately locked the doors and sped away. Jen was hysterical, crying and repeatedly asking Jessica, did you see that? But Jessica hadn't seen anything, though she admitted she felt the same unsettling sensation and heard an inexplicable noise. As Jen calmed down, she began explaining what she'd seen. She said she'd heard a branch snap and looked over, only to spot a pale white face about nine feet off the ground, peeking around a tree. She described it to me as best as she could, it looked like a lifeless husk of a humanoid, devoid of any emotion or life. The figure had no eyes, only a few strands of something resembling hair, and where its mouth should have been, there was a red stain that Jen believed was blood. As Jen recounted this, she trembled and even cried. I'd never seen her like that, and I trust her completely, so I believe every word she said. Afterward, I had to comfort and calm her down, but she admitted that she still sees that face in her dreams sometimes. I hope she eventually recovers from this experience, but when you encounter something so traumatic, it sticks with you. I have a lot of stories to tell, and many of my friends have opened up to me about their experiences, so maybe there'll be more to share. If you enjoyed this one, stay tuned. I've always been into caving, and some of the best caves to explore happen to be either abandoned or half-excavated mines. This usually happens when a silver or gold deposit turns out to be much smaller than diggers first imagined, or if a mine is vulnerable to flooding or gas. Anyway, about an hour into exploring one of these mines, I found myself going through a narrow chasm, just wide enough for me to turn sideways and slide through. If you took a cross-section of this chasm, it would look like a series of hourglass shapes stacked on top of each other. The cave ceiling was wide, then narrowed near my chest, widened again by my hips, and narrowed again by my feet. About 30 feet into the chasm, the bottom completely dropped away, and I had to press my feet outward against the walls to hold myself up, all while still turned sideways and sliding through the narrow upper section. I couldn't really see my feet or what I was pressing against, so I was just feeling my way forward. Eventually, one of my feet slipped, quickly followed by the other, and I dropped down a few inches, catching myself on my wrists and elbows, with the bottom of my ribcage resting on the skinny part of the hourglass. The position didn't give me enough leverage with my arms to pull myself up, so I started feeling around with my feet for something to stand on. I was concerned, but not panicking, yet. But no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't find anything to stand on. My arms started getting tired, and I began sliding deeper into the narrow part of the hourglass. 
As I slid lower, I realized that each time I exhaled, I dropped down an inch or so, and the skinny part of the hourglass was starting to compress my chest, preventing me from fully inhaling. That realization, that I couldn't breathe, triggered panic, and I started frantically kicking, searching for something solid, but all I managed to do was slide even deeper. By this point, I was really freaking out. I was stuck taking half-breaths, thinking that I was either going to get stuck and suffocate or, possibly worse, pass out and fall into the chasm below, which I couldn't even see the bottom of. Then, for some reason, it suddenly dawned on me, I could try putting one foot against one wall and the other against the opposite side, pressing as hard as I could to gain enough leverage to push myself up and catch my breath. I ended up using this technique, inching my way forward until I reached a spot where the floor came back up, and I could stand and rest. Only then did I have enough space to maneuver and finally get out of there. That whole experience put me off caving for a long time afterward. Dear viewers, if you'd indulge me, I'd like you to close your eyes, listen to my voice, and imagine something. You're crouched in a dark, dank space, barely the height of a large moving truck. The air is hot and stale in your lungs, your eyes sting from residual dust hanging in the air, and echoing all around you is the sound of sharp metal slamming against rock. Then, all of a sudden, there's a distinct rumbling. In the darkness, the tunnel around you trembles briefly, and then, silence. No voices, no dull sound of pickaxes hitting rock, nothing. But then you hear a noise, something like a slow exhale at first, but it grows louder and louder, until it sounds like the roaring of a jet engine. It's the sound of more than half a million gallons of water rushing toward you. What follows are the final few seconds of your life, seconds spent in abject terror as you scramble for safety, but fail. If you found that extremely anxiety-inducing, it's okay. This is just a story. But on September 15, 2011, this was a nightmarish reality for the miners of South Wales Gleisen Colliery. A subterranean tidal wave instantly took the lives of four miners as it tore through hundreds of meters of mine shafts in just six seconds. Three of their comrades managed to escape to the surface, but were forced to endure an agonizing 33-hour wait to learn of their colleagues' fate. The tragedy was caused by a project designed to improve the mine's ventilation by connecting two separate shafts. Flooding is always a danger in subterranean excavations, but due to a complex pumping system in the mine, this threat was thought to be under control. Underground explosions were also commonplace, and a number of safety procedures were in place to prevent structural instability. Yet, on the morning of September 15th, these procedures suffered a catastrophic failure. Nigel Evans, a miner employed at Gleisen for only three days at the time of the accident, later described the horror. He recalled suddenly hearing a tremendous whooshing noise, then feeling an unusual gust of wind flowing down the tunnel. Seconds later, he saw a nearby lamp shaking furiously as the earth around him began to tremble. Then he spotted his co-worker, Jake Wyatt, running up the tunnel, terror-stricken. Jake looked up, saw Nigel, and screamed, run. It was all Nigel needed to hear. I didn't look back. I just ran out of the main drift as fast as I could, he later said. As they ran, Jake, well past his prime, began to slow down. The lack of oxygen in the mining tunnel only made it worse. In the end, Jake was on the verge of passing out, and as he slowed to a crawl, Nigel begged him to keep going. I kept trying to drag him with me, but he was so exhausted he couldn't speak a word," Nigel stated. Then, he saw the water rushing up behind them. I have never felt such fear. I was convinced we were both going to die. The water rushed toward both men, roaring and frothing, but stopped just short of the exhausted Jake, who had collapsed above the waterline. It was nothing short of a miracle. The survivors crawled through mud and sludge, before finally seeing daylight. Nigel believed that, since he and Jake had gotten out alive, others might have been lucky enough to escape too. Yet, as they reached the paramedics on the surface, Jake's response hit like a gut punch, they're gone, he said. There's no hope for the others. The others he referred to were 62-year-old Charles Breslin, 50-year-old David Powell, 
39-year-old Gary Jenkins, and 39-year-old Philip Hill. Despite search and rescue efforts that scoured the 100-year-old mine for 24 hours, no signs of life were found. In a heart-wrenching twist, the families of the missing men asked the rescue teams to call off the search. They were all too aware of the dangers and believed that losing more lives in recovery efforts would only add to the tragedy. Waiting for the inevitable news was almost unbearable. Mavis Breslin, wife of one of the lost miners, later described the ordeal as stressful, never-ending waiting. Specially trained divers were sent in to attempt body recovery, but silt and debris made the water far too murky. The teams then tried to pump out the floodwater while simultaneously adding oxygen to the tunnels, hoping against hope for survivors. Gary Jenkins' teenage son, Alex, later said, I didn't sleep for two days, and the rest of the family were in constant tears. News of the disaster spread rapidly, and by noon, a media circus had gathered at Gleisen to document the rescue attempts. By the next morning, hope had nearly run dry. Mavis Breslin admitted that when they found the first body, it didn't look like they were going to find the others either. Down at the local community center, a grim atmosphere of hopelessness began to take hold. Lynette Powell, waiting for news of her husband, David, was advised to go home. It was the right decision, she later said, because soon after we were told that he was gone. From then on, we were just numb. By 6 p.m. that day, confirmation came that the last of the four bodies had been recovered, leaving families and rescuers shattered that their efforts had been in vain. An incensed public demanded an inquiry, but the Welsh Health and Safety Executive stated it was too early to determine the cause. Eventually, the mine's manager was arrested on suspicion of gross negligence manslaughter, but was later found not guilty. Yet, he remained a focal point of the community's anger. Welsh poet laureate Gwyneth Lewis visited the village the day after the disaster and later wrote a poem in memory of the lost miners. It's a profound tribute, but two lines seem to stand out, asterisk leaves drift down, but they won't heal the sentence of the mountain. Asterisk. Thanks for sticking around till the end. If you enjoyed the story, don't forget to give the video a like and leave a comment with your thoughts. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you never miss a terrifying tale. See you in the next one.